Let's see here. Hello, welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Call. I'm the president of the New America Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event. A uh, couple of housekeeping words before I introduce the speakers and get us started. Um, this would be a good time to silence your electronic devices if you haven't done that already. As you can tell from the bright lights and a couple of cameras, we are webcasting this live, and so we are on the record. And so when we do turn to questions, if you have one, please uh, wait for a microphone to come around and identify yourself and, um, and save your long, longer uh, soliloquies for the hallway afterward, and please ask, ask a succinct question uh, when the time comes. The format is uh, reflected on the screen, which is that uh, Alec is going to present uh, with these slides initially, and then uh, General Miggs will come up on stage so as not to block the screen after that and respond, offer some comments and reflections, and then I'll join them as well, uh, moderate a little discussion, and then turn to you, and we'll have you out of here about 1.30. I'm really pleased to, to be present for this today and to have uh, a very minor hand in bringing it to your attention because uh, we're very proud at New America of Alec's work, which uh, comes out of the thinking of some of my colleagues in the Counterterrorism Strategy Initiative here at New America, Peter Bergen and Brian Fishman and Catherine Tiedemann and others who have been bringing forward these kinds of papers. Uh, as we were talking in the hallway, it's very difficult uh, around a subject like improvised explosive devices to work with data systematically in an open source format. There's a lot of reasons why that's difficult. We may talk about some of them over the course of the day, but I think you'll find in Alex's paper and his presentation the value of that kind of open discourse and also just the fresh eyesight that a determined researcher with the right skills uh, such as Alec can bring to a complicated subject. When we talk about the wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan, when we read the newspapers and follow them as uh, analysts or just as citizens, there's a disproportionate amount of attention paid to nuances of the human factor in wars, the political change, the emotional balance of the Afghan president. But I think commanders who actually are in the field struggling against these enemies from day to day recognize that the evolving role of these devices and these tactics associated with them is uh, a much greater proportion, of uh, much greater importance than, than the proportion of coverage in the American media would suggest. This has really been a profoundly important change in asymmetric warfare. It does not receive a lot of attention. There was a brilliant series that Rick Atkinson did in the Post a couple of years back that clarified the, the work of General Miggs's team. But uh, this is really the war as it's lived by soldiers and officers in the field. And, and even though we're going to deal with a geopolitical analysis today by and large, um, really welcome the opportunity to bring the subject forward in public with all of you. Uh, just briefly, the two uh, speakers, we really are very fortunate to have both of them here today. Alec, you'll hear from him in a minute. Uh, he is a national security analyst based in Washington, D.C., a former Army officer and a graduate of Georgetown and Johns Hopkins Universities. And it's his paper, Improvised Explosive Devices in Southern Afghanistan and Western Pakistan from 2002 to 2009 that we're releasing today as a New America policy paper. There are copies outside. If you haven't grabbed them already, you can take them on your way out. Uh, after Alec presents his work, uh, we're very fortunate to have the really the dominant uh, leader on this subject in, in the U.S. military over the last four or five years, General Miggs. Montgomery Miggs had a 35-year career in the United States Army. Uh, he, between 2006 and 2008, was the director of the mouthful, Joint Improvised Explosive Device Defeat Organization, which must sound like something if it's pronounced as an acronym, but I'm not going to try. Uh, it was an OSD initiative and uh, really made a lot of progress in thinking about both uh, tactical responses to the enemy's use of these devices, but also uh, bringing forward a strategic framework for understanding the role in asymmetric war. Uh, General Miggs is now the President and Chief Executive Officer of Business Executives for National Security, and he has taught extensively at Georgetown, so as, as well as other places in his Army career. 
So with that, let's bring Alec up and walk through his slides, and then we'll hear from General Meggs after that. I want to thank you, Steve, for uh, that kind introduction. And uh, I also want to thank uh, the New America Foundation, uh, especially uh, Peter Bergen and, and Brian Fishman and Catherine Tiedemann for hosting the event, for publishing the paper. And I want to express my pre appreciation to General Miggs for joining us to discuss this problem today. A couple of notes. The project would not have been possible without the support and assistance of Hazard Management Solutions, who provided some of the data and the staff of the Geospatial Information Systems Department at Fenwick Library at George Mason University who helped with some of the software. To avoid confusion, I want to point out that uh, I use the terms IED and BOM interchangeably and that I use the word casualty to refer to both fatalities and injuries. Finally, I want to emphasize that I'm here as a consultant in affiliation with the New America Foundation and I'm solely responsible for both these remarks and the paper that uh, is published today. The homemade bomb phenomenon has been a prominent feature of conflicts around the world and throughout history, and the homemade bomb experience has never been an exclusively American one, whether in Sri Lanka, the United Kingdom, Lebanon, Indonesia, Colombia, Chechnya, Algeria, Afghanistan, or Oklahoma. Users of, of homemade bombs are what one might call equal opportunity offenders, and they've offended more and more frequently in the last 40 years. Why are these improvised explosive devices, as they're known by Western militaries, more and more prolific? Here are nine reasons that I find convincing. The first is admittedly abstract, but still very important. Bombings are particularly effective as a form of political theater designed to stoke fear and uncertainty, to manufacture a sense of insufficient security, to divide the population along social fault lines, to provoke overreaction of authorities, and to erode the perceived legitimacy of government. Shock, surprise, devastation are the main factors of IED's effectiveness in creating these perceptions. Second, and a little bit more practical, the, the, the general progress of commercial electronic devices such as cell phones, which are diverse in their capability and widespread in their manufacture, have lent increasingly effective, if unintended, technology to bombers and bomb makers. Third, trends of increasing urbanization and population density over the past half century have permitted IEDs to have greater effects in terms of physical and human damage, as well as political influence when they occur in built-up locales. Fourth, the unparalleled military capability of great powers such as the United States, supported by consistent monopolies in sophisticated weaponry, has given adversaries few options but to pursue advantages in asymmetric ways. The innocuous appearance and purpose of many IED components allow fighters to hide or move their weapons in the open, enabling, enabling them to evade detection. And fertilizer is the classic example of apparently innocent and plausibly deniable bomb component. Six, when it comes to their construction and configuration, the variability of IEDs is so wide that defenders are challenged to cover all possibilities simultaneously and continuously. This leads to a cat and mouse game where bombers constantly jump from technique to technique, depending on what the defenders are doing to suppress bombs at the moment. Once in place, IEDs may cause much damage while posing little physical risk to the assailant, who may or may not even be in the area at detonation. They're very effective at causing death and destruction, and so for terrorists, they're fundamentally a high payoff, low risk weapon. Improvements in internet communications and multimedia technology allow bomb events to be witnessed nearly instantly by global audiences, thereby multiplying their potential political effect. But an increasingly and, and ninth and more influential factor in the ascent of IEDs is that of knowledgeable bomb makers, bombers, and facilitators who perpetrate attacks directly, disseminate their know-how internationally, and travel to train and enable others to conduct bombings. The general trend is greater use and faster development of bomb technology among insurgents and terrorists worldwide. To describe what I mean, you know, please indulge me in using a second military acronym, and this is the second of two that I'll use. I'll spare you any more. That acronym is TTP, which refers to the tactics, techniques, and procedures of the bombers. In the past 40 years, we observe a phenomenon of TTP acceleration, 
in which generations of terrorists and insurgents take progressively shorter periods of time to accomplish advances in bomb technology and processes, supported by information sharing and training among fighters and improvements in available components. Mark McGinnis, who is Director of Training at Hazard Management Solutions, showed me how it took the Irish Republican Army about 30 years to progress from bombs initiated by wire to those initiated using remote control to focused explosives called shape charges, and the group had only begun to exchange information with other terrorist organizations toward the end of this period. By contrast, it took about six years for militants to make the same improvements in Chechnya, three years for fighters in Gaza, and about 12 months for insurgents in Iraq. In Afghanistan, Pakistan in 2003, fighters began with remote control technology in hand and have quickly progressed to innovations such as switches that cannot be found with metal detectors. The compression of this cycle of training, execution, and innovation means that militaries and governments must exert great effort and resources to keep pace with the bombers while making important choices about how to prepare for the future security environment. Yet if IEDs are a weapon like any other, why bother to study them at all? Can't terrorists use other weapons to achieve the same or similar effects? And after all, does it really matter to a policymaker if enemy fighters prefer bombs to guns? What it seems is unusual about IEDs is that with meager resources, weak non-state actors have introduced a model for str strategic competition wherein they may effectively and consistently challenge powerful states. Prior to the 1970s and the introduction of the suicide car bomb by the forerunners of Hezbollah, the effects of homemade bombs were primarily tactical, meaning that the use of IEDs did not cause major changes in national strategy, policies, or programs. This changed in October 1983 when the suicide car bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut arguably led the Reagan administration four months later to withdraw from the multinational force mission in Lebanon. More recently, however, the clever, sustained, and adaptive use of IEDs has cheaply and effectively imposed enormous costs that present burdensome implications for American strategy, policy, and programs. Since 2003, the U.S. Department of Defense has spent at least $17.5 billion on technology and training, built a massive new military bureaucracy, and established unconventional processes for introducing new programs, all in response to the problems presented by IEDs. Above all else, the United States has accepted engagement in two costly counterinsurgency campaigns characterized by the imperative to suppress IEDs. Non-state actors that use IEDs now believe they can cause the general exhaustion of resources as well as overall collapse in the states and governments they oppose. They believe this can be accomplished cheaply, effectively, and with less risk using homemade bombs. Because of their lethality, propaganda applications, variable technologies, and seemingly innocuous components, IEDs are tactical weapons that impose costs with strategic implications. In this study, I sought examples of the spread and evolution of IEDs in the border region of southern Afghanistan and western Pakistan between 2002 and mid-2009. I used openly available reports as well as some private database inf information to analyze bombs in Kandahar, Helmand, and Nimroz provinces in Afghanistan, and parts of Balochistan province in Pakistan. This resulted in a number of statistics that are in the paper, as well as a series of 42 maps that depict the estimated intensity of IED activity across the region over time. You see an example of such a map here on the screen. My research found that bomb activity has consistently increased in volume and geographical distribution since 2002, and that lethality has generally increased there since 2004. I found an increase in bomb activity of at least 40% in every year except 2007. This time series of maps showing uh, annual IED incidents illustrates the phenomenon. And if we could bring up the video. This is a, a time series that is essentially an animation of a series of maps with all events from 2002 to 2009. Note here how IED activity escalates dramatically beginning in 2005. This is 2003. 2004, and then here 2005, and, and, and uh, again by a factor of two and a half in 2006, and how it spreads generally from, uh, from Kandahar and Quetta, this isn't working, from Kandahar and Quetta uh, into Garashk and Lashkargah, 
gaining intensity and spreading into the Hellman River Valley. And this is the last, uh, the first six months of 2009. So again, we have this arc of activity. If we could bring up, uh, all right. Well, I'll just go without the, uh, I'll go without the overlay. We have this arc of activity that goes from Quetta through Chaman and Spinboldak into Kandahar City, Goresh and Lashgarga in this area here, and then spreading further into the Helmand River Valley, and then on to Delaram and Zaranj in this area eventually. Meanwhile, we also see an increase in IEDs in Pakistan in Bela uh, tri tribal areas like Dara Bukti here. I also found that there are uh, two major trends among all events. The first is a concerted Taliban bombing campaign across southern Afghanistan and at least Quetta in Pakistan involving command-initiated attacks against NATO and Afghan entities in which civilian casualties are tolerated. These at attacks are depicted in the map on the, the first slide of the slideshow, if we could bring that up. Again, this is IED events with 10 or more casualties uh, through the entire period, and you can note the concentration of, of events uh, on this side of the border and including parts of Quetta. The second major trend is of time-initiated attacks against infrastructure, especially gas, electricity, and rail infrastructure, in which civilian casualties are avoided and Baylock separatists are thought responsible. We see this trend in slide two, and we can see how that trend is, if we could bring up the second slide, we can see how that trend is limited to the Pakistani side of the border here. These differences are also reinforced by the statistic that 78% of all casualties occurred in Afghanistan rather than Pakistan. If one compares the two maps, and you can see this in the next slide, it becomes clear that the Pakistani city of Quetta is a point of confluence for both trends. Quetta is also significant because many who study the Taliban conclude that the high command responsible for at least the southern region of Afghanistan, known as the Quetta Shura, is located there, as may be the Supreme Taliban leader, Mullah Muhammad Omar. In 1,803 events and at least 6,201 civilian and security force casualties, including dead and wounded, we see that half of all attacks occurred in Kandahar province, especially the Argandab River area, Kandahar city, and along the route between Kandahar and Quetta. A quarter of all events happened in Helmand province, especially in Nari Siraj and Lashkar Gad districts, and Hellman overtook Kandahar as the leading location of bomb activity in 2009, presumably as a result of increased ISAF operations there, though it is, is too early to say so definitively. I learned that one cannot assume that merely the presence of foreign troops causes IED problems. Surprisingly, the location with the highest average number of victims per event has been Zaranj in Nimroz province along the Afghan-Iranian border, which is here. And, and that's an area rife with suicide attacks and an area in which ISAF troops are not consistently or heavily presented. I lied about those, uh, those, that acronym. I'm, I'm using the, the ISAF acronym uh, to describe the NATO forces, the coalition forces there in Afghanistan. I promise no more. Um, so... Indeed, you know, there, there are two areas where the highest average casualties per event were the, the border towns of Zaranj in the west and Spin Buldak in the east along the Afghan border. There are several interesting implications for policy and decision makers at the strategic, operational, and tactical levels. At the level of national strategy, the consistency and virulency of the AFPAC IED problem, at least along this section of the Duran line, support sustained U.S. involvement there in advancement of the primary national security objective of protecting the U.S. homeland from terror attacks like those which occurred on 9-11. The trends support our continued involvement in Afghanistan as a matter of national interest so long as the Taliban remain committed to retaking power and to protecting al-Qaeda. I also see justification in stopping the continued growth of an international Islamist extremist, extremist movement, increasingly more effective at conducting terrorist attacks by virtue of the training and experience individual fighters gain in Afghanistan. Where the Taliban reach into Pakistan, such as in Quetta, 
we clearly have an interest in neutralizing their influence. And insofar as Baloch separatism might destabilize Pakistan or detract from the efforts to defeat the Taliban, we should consider what steps might be appropriate to this challenge as well. It is not fully clear how our policies consider Taliban cross-border activity or Baloch separatism to be linked to Afghan stability or to the objectives of, elimin of eliminating safe haven for al-Qaeda, stopping the spread of Islamist extremist terrorism, or securing the Pakistani nuclear arsenal. With respect to military strategy, the data justifies the argument that the Afghanistan Pakistan theater was neglected as a primary front in a war against the al-Qaeda organization and their ta Taliban enablers. This project illustrates the exponential escalation of violence instigated by the Taliban against pro-American interests in Afghanistan, while U U.S. forces were more or less committed in Iraq between 2003 and 2008. The strategy of lightweight, rapidly decisive regime change in Afghanistan, followed by the immediate reorientation of resources and priorities towards Iraq, resulted in the creation of time and space in which the Taliban could re regroup. The renewed assault began in 2005 and 2006, which is made clear in the time series we saw earlier. The data raises questions about some operational priorities. First, why beginning in 2008 did ISAF favor large deployments into Helmand province over similarly strong movements into Kandahar, the historic Taliban stronghold? We found that of the two provinces, Kandahar has been the leading center of violence with twice as many IED events as Helmand. The corridor between Kandahar and Quetta, including Spin Boldak in Afghanistan and Chaman in Pakistan, has been highly active as a location of bombings, so has been the Argandab Valley. Yet many openly available, by many openly available estimates, ISAF troop strength in Kandahar totals about 8,000 and growing. This is less than half of the estimated strength in Helmand province, where totals are closer to 19,000. The argument for Helman might be that severing the Taliban's grip on the op opium grown and traded throughout the Helman River Valley preceded in priority the type of operations now discussed and indeed underway in Kandahar. Though the drug question is an important one, aggressively addressing security problems where they are most prevalent and challenging the Taliban in their home base are at least as significant. A second operational implication asks about the nature and extent of theater security cooperation activities involving not only the Afghan National Security Forces, but also the Pakistani Security Forces, especially the Frontier Corps. We hear much about the U.S. and NATO commitment to growing the capacity of Afghan forces to secure their country. And Afghan security force involvement is a central theme of ISAF operations and public communications. But we don't know as much about efforts to improve the Frontier Corps and other Pakistani authorities' capabilities to secure the Duran line from their own side or to handle, handle the multiple different and interrelated internal security threats they now face. At the tactical level, it makes sense to try to learn more about why the rate of injured survival, and that's the, the ratio of soldiers surviving with wounds to those sustaining fatal wounds, why that rate has steadily declined in this region from about 75% in 2004 to 59% in 2009, and why it is that nearly 80% of all casualties in Helmand province are due to IEDs. The rate of injured survival is about 84% in all of Afghanistan and 88% in all of the Iraq war, so the local trend bucks the more general trends. It would take more research to understand this, but here are a few possible causes. One is, in, one is increased proficiency among the bombers who may have become more effective over time with practice. Another is the introduction of devices such as those that resist detection with metal detectors. Yet another reason may be that as the Quetta Shura has reorganized and take a greater, taken greater control over operations in Afghanistan, bombers there have benefited from the deliberate support received from across the border. So how do we stem the continued use of these bombs? There isn't much we can do about some of the reasons for the increased use of IEDs. We can't reverse decades of progress in consumer electronic devices or household goods. We can't undo the internet. We shouldn't relinquish superior capabilities in conventional combat. And when it comes to the knowledge terrorists share among one another, we can't put the cat back in the bag. Fundamentally, the question of counter IED policy amounts to distinctions among several basic approaches. At one end of the spectrum, we have the option of rapidly fielding technological countermeasures. This is a mostly reactive approach. More proactively, we should focus on understanding and dissecting human networks that produce and emplace IEDs. Significantly here, we should concentrate on the modes of human communication that enable the phenomenon of TTP acceleration. 
We should also educate ourselves about the technical and tactical aspects of homemade bombs so that we may correctly identify and mitigate the immediate circumstances of their employment. These are all right and necessary responses to the IED problem. However, these approaches will only sustain our long-term defenses against the IED threat in a limited way. To delve further into the problem, we must understand and approach IEDs at the level of components, treating positively identifiable dual-use consumer electronics and explosive precursors as potentially hostile technologies, as well as training more analysts, military personnel, investigators, and first responders to recognize indicators of many stages of IED development. It is quite a challenge to train legions of security officials to recognize consumer technologies, explosive formulas, and smuggling techniques that present IED risk. We must hold informed discussions about IEDs and include in these discussions examples of empirically derived trends drawn from real bomb data, but do so without conveying advantage to our adversaries. Accomplishing the appropriate balance between security and transparency is a huge challenge when it comes to releasing bomb data for purposes of research. But most importantly, we must strive to understand the ideologies of human organizations that seek asymmetric, asymmetric options to circumvent our security. The incentives lead terrorists to use IEDs, and increased usage of IEDs is both unfortunate and predictable. It will not be enough to react to these devices, even when they are preventable, in order to accomplish our strategic objectives, especially the security of the homeland, it will be necessary to understand, intercept, and counteract the ideologies of those that use IEDs, more so than the technologies they employ. This is a very human problem with the very human solution of unrelenting study and assessment of human movements to devise, distribute, and deploy bombs made at home. Thank you very much. Well, it's a uh, pleasure for me to be here today. I haven't uh, gone out and spoken like this to a group of people about this subject since I left the Joint IED Defeat Organization <laughs> in December of 2007. Interesting story about the title. We tried to create a simpler title when I was reorganizing what's called JIDO, and the bureaucracy wouldn't let us do it because they said the title we wanted was impermissible because of the way the uh, defense staff was set up in OSD and where we were subordinated. And so we got stuck with this monster. But every once in a while you lose a little battle to win a bigger one. Let me just walk through some of the conclusions here. And you'll, you'll all have to understand I'm dancing around a tightrope of security. Uh, when you do a job like this, the one I had running JIDO, you sign your life away in about 15 different ways. And at the end it says, you know, basically we could prosecute you if you violate this. So, But I'll try to be as uh, open as I can. Uh, Alec, thanks for a great study. Um, it may surprise you that, and I'll explain why as I go through, uh, what you disconfirm in some ways is more useful uh, than what you've, the, argu the basic argument you've made. For instance, the business about Shiite transfer of uh, their technologies from Iraq to uh, Afghanistan. Though there has been some transfer. And I, I wish I could lay out for you the state of the art as it was in December of 2007. I can't, but I can hint. Data is a terrible problem in this game. Uh, I had a a handful, a significant handful of very highly trained uh, people in operations research systems analysis. And the, the complicated nature and the dirtiness of the data was very, very frustrating. The problem is if you have a patrol of, say, three Humvees and one gets blown up, uh, the instantaneous responsibility of the group is to secure themselves, report, ensure that anybody injured gets back to a hospital within an hour because we've learned that in this kind of a trauma game, if you can get a seriously injured soldier, Marine, or Navy EOD man, or Air Force airman who's doing uh, road work, 
to a surgeon within an hour, there's a very good chance you can save his or her life. Um, the ratio of wounded to uh, KIA in the Korean conflict in Vietnam was about six to one. It's now, it was about, I'm sorry, it was two to one. It's now six to one, or at least it was in 2007. So we're saving a lot more people as a result of that. So you can look at the reporting and see how everything that they do in that report is time hacked to when helicopter called, helicopter on station, helicopter landed, helicopter departed for base. We never used to do that in Desert Storm. So my point is, it's very hard to get a couple of privates to go around with uh, tweezers and pick up explosive residue and wire and stuff like that, unless it's a fairly big event and you get EOD personnel there. Uh, sometimes they have the opportunity to do it, but the emphasis is just not there because basically, because we can't produce the results, Units don't see the value in collect, taking the extra pain to collect the data. And if they're in the middle of a firefight, you can forget data. That's just not going to happen. Um, this is an interesting game of what's old is new. What's old is new. The, the tribal networks that have been the survival systems for tribes in places like Afghanistan and rural Iraq for millennia, very easily transition to the networks that provide the services, the equipment, the training, and the people to run the IED program. So the, what's changed is all an IED is is artillery. Could we put up your that last slide you had? And I'll use that as to explain what I'm talking about. Take a second. Um, remember, in any modern combat, since the French beat the, uh, finally chased the English out of France at the end of the Hundred Years' War, artillery has been the major killer on the battlefield. So in World War One, World War Two, uh, not so much in Vietnam. That was more of a, uh, you know, perhaps our artillery did more killing than theirs just because they didn't have any. But artillery is a huge factor on the battlefield. Um, all you're seeing here when they bring the slide back up is the distribution of Taliban and Al-Qaeda artillery strikes. What's different is the availability of technology and the um, trajectory that takes the kinetic energy source to the individual. So. This bottle of water's got somewhat less volume than a 105 millimeter artillery round. But if this strikes 20 meters away from you, it's probably not going to hurt you if you can get to the ground quick enough. But if I can set this IED so it goes up here when the soldier's here, it's far more accurate than modern artillery, which makes it far more effective at the point of attack. It's very important that you grasp that um, principle. We are not seeing anything new in terms of effects at the point of attack, other than greater accuracy, because the trajectory is a human one. And the nature of that trajectory, as Alec points out, and I'm just stating this in a different way, changes based on the social environment in which it occurs. So the trajectory and the systems that provide the IED are different in Afghanistan than they are from Iraq because the tribes are different, the terrain is different, uh, and so it's adapted to that. The other factor of modern warfare involves the profusion of new information technology that comes out on about a six to a nine month cycle. You know, Moore's Law says, the density on a chip will double every two years, uh, or 18 months to two years. And uh, that drives tremendous amount of innovation. If I pull out my turned off cell phone, this is your standard BlackBerry phone, this phone has more computing power 
and the GE-225 computer that was used at the United States Military Academy when I was a cadet. This baby right here. In fact, it's probably got a quantum more computing power. And the next cell phone that comes out will probably allow you to talk to it completely for commands. And that will have significantly more computing power than this does. Now, if I want to go high tech in the IED business, this can be a good way to go. However, if I find that that's frustrated by what organizations like the Joint IED Defeat Organization are doing, I can easily adapt to using missile guidance wire as the source of the command detonation. And we saw that both in Iraq and in Afghanistan, as we put in countermeasures to keep them from going upscale, they went downscale. Very adaptive, and they would invent things, they would do things very quickly. <clears throat> Iraq had a profusion of uh, unused military ordnance that wasn't the case in Afghanistan, so they've had to be more creative. But they do get support from across the Pakistani border. So please understand we have to demystify this stuff because what we're seeing is what I call idiosyncratic warfare, not asymmetric warfare. And you use some terms that, that highlight that. Um, you talked about insufficiency of security, shock and surprise. Think of 9-11. When you, when you, if you really want to understand this kind of warfare. In 9-11, the people on the plane were only useful in terms of their value and shock effect in the way they were killed. And the planes were turned into crude cruise missiles by virtue of the fact that the uh, terrorists had taken over the cockpit. Now, the purpose of that attack was to affect American political will directly. You know, in uh, Clausewitz talks about the, the, the Trinity, people, army, king. And in his time frame, you beat the army to, to affect the king. World War II, modern wars, you see more of an attempt to affect the people. Strategic bombing uh, of Germany during uh, World War II, strategic bombing of Japan. This kind of attack is directed solely at the people without having to address the greater superiority of American allied forces. That's what this is all about. It's all about political will. It's all about shock, horror, it's weird, I don't understand it, we can't deal with it, let's go home. To get away from it. Well, you can't. You can't get away from it. In fact, we're now starting to see IEDs being used in northern Mexico uh, as a result of the confrontation there between the Mexican government and the drug cartels. So the, uh, the thing that we did in the Joint IED Defeat Organization is to take a look at this problem and say, okay, how do we help units in the field deal with this problem? And we came up with a hierarchy of find the network and defeat it defeat the device, and train the heck out of troops before they go. And, in, and I would argue with you a bit about the technological solution to this. If I can develop sensors that can see the IED and, and uh, transmit that location in the situation awareness tools that soldiers and Marines have, I can keep him away from it. The last thing in the world I want to do is protect the soldier at the point of attack. I mean, we do that, obviously, because you're not going to find every IED. You're not going to pre-debt the ones you find. So you have to have a way of armoring the soldier in the vehicle. But that's the last ditch defense, the one you want to avoid. Ideally, I would break down the network before it delivers the IED. If I can't do that, I would rather find the IED and dispose of it before the soldier ever gets there. And we spend a lot of time, a lot of money doing that, and we're becoming quite successful. We lowered the effectiveness of a single statistical IED in Iraq by a factor of six, which is not a trivial result. Um, how we did that, I can't really go into, but it requires a tremendous amount of synergy between 
national means of intelligence constructed, organized, and focused in a very different way than is the norm in big wars, and very careful preparation of units before they go down range. So if you were to go to the National Training Center in California where a bulk of the Army units train, you would find that the techniques used by the Iraqi American enemy change every six months to fit exactly what's going on downrange. So every unit that comes through there is seeing the latest possible version of what they're going to expect downrange. Now that takes a huge investment, a lot of care, a lot of feedback from downrange, but it's worth it because when folks get there, they have a leg up on the problem. Remember, all we're seeing here is the template of enemy fires. That's all it is. And in February of 2007, I wrote a memo that predicted that the enemy would try to attack this way uh, to isolate Kandahar. And there's another thrust. If you had done the research up here, you would have seen a similar pattern from Peshawar toward between Kabul and uh, Kandahar to cut the main ring road. So in terms of maneuver, if you step back from this and you step back away from the uh, shock and surprise, you realize that the on-the-ground movement of this pattern is nothing new. It's how they do it. Uh, just to answer your question about Helmand and Kandahar, remember until this last year, the troop-to-task ratio in Afghanistan was um, woefully insufficient for the mission. When I went to uh, Afghanistan in February of 2007, we had uh, one army brigade on 400 miles of Durand, Durand Line in the Himalayan mountains at altitudes of 14,000 feet. Uh, wearing 90-pound packs, uh, never getting a hot meal about well, every 30 days when they were on mission, staying on mission for about 90 days, being watched every night by scouts across the border looking for an opportunity to find a platoon position that was weak and then trying to overrun it. The 105-millimeter howitzer a battalion that was with the 10th Mountain on that mission had already fired 25,000 rounds. And they'd only been there nine months. That's a lot of artillery. So, um, I suspect if you could go back and put the unit boundaries on there and see what the hot spots were of that particular time uh, and where they had to put the bulk of their forces, that would, that would answer you know, the question you raised. We were aware that in Afghanistan, the degree of lethality was greater per IED than in Iraq, and my theory on that was you had more dismounted operations. It's easier to get at dismounted uh, soldiers with a relatively small IED than it is uh, soldiers that are running around in armored vehicles. The difference being that you have to get on the ground to be with the people. But a lot of the attacks in Iraq were on vehicles, not on individuals per se. More of the IED strikes were on groups of people moving around. Now they're getting, uh, they're doing a lot more vehicular stuff because you got more vehicles to deal with. But remember, when you had 10th Mountain in the mountains, you didn't have soldiers, you had soldiers in squads and patrols out on the ground. So a relatively small IED could do a lot of damage if you could get two or three people in the same location. Um, I don't disagree with the idea that this is a social problem as much as it is a military problem. And one of the initiatives that Jido advanced that's getting some press now were the human terrain teams. I don't know if you've heard about those. We went out and said, it's clear that your average 23, 24-year-old junior officer, 27-year-old captain in command of a company who can't speak Dari or who can't speak Arabic 
has a huge problem understanding the social makeup of the problem that he's dealing with. What if we could get an anthropologist or sociologist who's fluent in the language, who understands the society, who understands the norms, to be there as kind of an, not a language interpreter, an interpreter of what they're dealing with. That has been a very successful program to the point where one brigade commander said, uh, I just would not let you have my home and human terrain team person because she's so valuable to me. And that another version of that came up on NPR yesterday. So there's no question that the way you alleviate the numbers here is you get the locals to stop condoning the use of IEDs. And one of the reasons ID fatalities went down so much in 2007 came from the awakening in El Anbar where the Sunnis stopped putting IEDs out. I mean, the incidence of IEDs went down. The key to that was work started by George Casey and John Evazade in August of 2006 to try to get the Sunni tribes to come over. And I asked Sean McFarlane, who was the brigade commander in Ramadi, you know, why, why the change? Why did, why did they, you know, come off the fence? And he said, I think they were just waiting for a partner they knew would be worth the effort and could help protect them after they made the jump onto our side. Which I thought was an interesting commentary, a typically Middle, Middle Eastern perspective from an American. So anyway, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, you know, I'll dance around a little bit, but I'll try to be as frank and open as I can. Great. Thank you, General Bex. Well, that was uh, both of you just fascinating, uh, riveting even. And I'm going to take a few minutes to start the questioning myself. And I wanted to ask each of you um, in a different way a question about the extent to which and the pathways by which technological innovation in this field passes laterally from non-state group to non-state group, even where those groups are not ideologically aligned or militarily aligned. For example, that map about Baluchistan and southern Afghanistan, if you happen by accident of professional uh, assignment to be a specialist about the geopolitics of those two particular places, to me the most striking thing, Alec, about your research was the the extent to which it highlighted the activity of Bugti Baluch separatism, <laughs> that was the surprise. And we knew the Taliban were pushing into Kandahar and Helmand, but that out of the same spot, Quetta, two entirely different insurgencies who are in fact not strategically aligned. One has an ambiguous client relationship with the Pakistani state. The other is seeking to break away from the Pakistani state. But they're sort of hanging out, it seems, in the same Quetta bazaars. And somehow these techniques passed between them and evolved simultaneously in time for two completely different purposes. So it, all you can do is guess at the extent to which information was exchanged between these two networks, Quetta-based networks. But I wondered if you could comment on that regionally as to what extent, to what extent you saw those two seri series of uh, increasing, capa uh, increasing capacity of IEDs being related to each other, to what extent were they coincidental? And then general, looking more globally and thinking about the evolution of expertise among Iraqi insurgent groups, what does the evidence tell us to the extent that you can comment on it about sharing between Shia and Sunni insurgents in Iraq and between Iraqi insurgents and other insurgents? You seem to allude to your finding that it was, it's more limited in the latter case than is generally uh, sometimes said. But uh, Alec, why don't you start with the regional piece? Yeah, the, uh, I'll, I'll do one better for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't talk about, but I, but I did discuss in the paper um, some other groups that are active in this area, e making this, this problem even more complicated than what you see on the screen. Um, and and I, pardon me if I butchered the pronunciation, but, but Sipai Sahaba, Pakistan, Close enough, sectarian group, yeah. Right. SSP, as they're abbreviated, 
and the Lashkari Jangvi, um, which is a related group. These are two other groups in the area that have an entirely different set of objectives. Um, most of them are oriented, uh, they're, they're anti-Shia in nature, and uh, they're oriented against uh, Iran. You also have a, a, a third group to add, um, the uh, Lashkari Toiba, uh, with uh, you know their their focus being uh, the Kashmir issue. Um, so we see we see the involvement and interrelation of of all of these groups on this map. So does it, so do you think your evidence shows that they have like technical meetings where they share information in a kind of Doctor Evil cartoon sense, or does this happen informally, or how does this? To what extent do you think the technology passes in real time? from one innovator to another, even if they're not aligned. Yeah, I mean, I think that we would all love to find that meeting and, and to do something about it, but um, the, the, the reality is I think that uh, this is far less formal. I think that face-to-face -face communication, um, the famous camps that, uh, that have dotted this area for, for such a long time, um, the, the dissemination of manuals. We saw a Taliban manual uh, appear a couple of years ago that had a whole chapter dedicated to the problem of how to build and use radio-controlled IEDs, radio-controlled bombs. Um, Is there any evidence of a marketplace function? Do people sell information to each other for uh, purposes of funding their own campaigns? Well, I, I wouldn't say for purposes of funding, but but I but I would say that there there is an exchange, and uh, you know there there are a lot of of great uh, journalists and reporters covering the transaction of of. Uh, this type of information in bazaars and, and, and in other uh, places of exchange throughout the area. General? The bazaars on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know where to go on the internet, Hold even up. without a password, if you know where to go on the internet, even without a password, is that sucker on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you're doing it. Uh, you can find how to build all kinds of IEDs. Uh, if you know where to go on the internet, you can find the design of the explosively formed projectile and uh, the mathematical equations for it from an American lab. And all this was put out, you know, in the good old days of the late 70s, or sorry, the early 90s when peace reigned and every, you know, war was over. And uh, people were just publishing a lot of academic data on how to make a uh, semi-spherical platter into a penetrator. And... Uh, so that's one way. The other way is personal, and there are two ways personally. One is through state-sponsored military training or state-sponsored training by operators. And another is insurgent cooperation, uh, which happens uh, routinely. Another way is through market opportunity. Um, the insurgents don't ride the front of the bow wave of change created by the $2 trillion investment worldwide in information technology. They ride the back side of the wave. So they'll take a, a, a displaced piece of equipment that can range from, the key to my car, which I push a button and it unlocks the car and the lights come on. And more recently now you have push button keys that allow the uh, car to start for you. An IED depends on closing a gap often, closing some kind of a gap where electrical current is moved across the gap or uh, pressure uh, sets off the detonator rather than an electri electrical charge. So think of all the stuff in your house that you could use to throw a switch from a distance, any of which is uh, capable of being designed without a lot of engineering expertise into a trigger. So if I took this and the this, and this receiver out of the car that sends the message that the electronic signal to unlock the doors, I now have an initiation sequence. Now the trick for people like me when I was in the business is to, to stay ahead of that. It's no good to follow it. You've got to stay ahead of it. The other is academic opportunity. There are people working on IEDs who have trained in the best universities in Europe and the United States on engineering and software design. That shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, you know, if you had somebody that was... Uh, 
pick a pick a universe a really good university, University of Cal at Berkeley, uh, in the uh, information technology graduate program there. And as a matter of conscience, he goes back to Iraq and finds himself uh, unhappy with uh, what he calls an occupation force. What, how might he be used by uh, either uh, what are called the uh, regime uh, hardcore who are still active or al-Qaeda? I mean, it's no mystery how these things happen. And that goes to your social perspective. Globally... Uh, the expertise evolves as the technology evolves, as they see opportunity. And, and there really isn't a lot of sharing, to my observation, across lines. Uh, we, we never saw an EFP being delivered, an explosively formed projectile being delivered by Sunnis, only by Shia-sponsored insurgents. And uh, Alec has pointed out there's not a whole lot of that going on in Afghanistan. So... If Hezbollah and Al-Quds could happen to be providing things, they're going to make darn sure they don't fall in the hands of uh, their Sunni brethren for a variety of reasons. And so there's some techniques at that level that you can protect in a proprietary sense if you're motivated to do so. Yes. So the other question I wanted to ask was to um, encourage the warming of the of the argument you uh, suggested you might be willing to have just for the sake of elucidation, uh, which is I, maybe I'll interpret your uh, concern incorrectly, but ask in the form of a question. General, what is the opportunity, if any, to interfere with, mark, educate uh, security officials about commercial technology that should properly be seen as a marker of IED development. Is that realistic to, in effect, I would assume that in the United States today, if somebody goes in and tries to buy uh, an extraordinary amount of a commercially available material useful and explosive, such as this guy in Colorado did, that there's enough markers distributed in the domestic system so that often someone will pick up the phone and call the FBI and say, this seems like someone who's crossed over a triggering marker that you've educated me about. But as to, on the global scale with IED technology, are there places where you can intervene and try to disrupt or mark or educate commercially available technology? It seems so low level. I'm, I'm not sure. It's not the same as marking centrifuges or something of that sort. Yeah, but you're, you're going to have to ask somebody else about that. Okay. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to interpret that as a yes, but <laughs> you didn't actually say yes. Uh, Alec, what, uh, what then is... Can you draw out a little bit your argument that more of this ought to be done, can be done? What, what do you mean when you say we ought to get in the business of trying to identify and disrupt certain commercial technology that's useful for well, this? Well, I think you, 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 know, you pointed to the answer when you asked the question, which is it's at the moment when an analyst or an investigator or uh, somebody who find themselves in the field observing these things puts two and two together and realizes that these triggers have been passed, that that is uh, the way we really interfere because nobody wants to believe that their cell phone is being marked uh, as a potential bomb component uh, when they go into Verizon and buy it. Um, it's really about uh, educating and, and training all, you know, legions of security officials, as I described them, to, to, to recognize these indicators. To be fair to General Miggs, the argument he suggested he had was whether or not it was valuable to invest large amounts of money and energy in the development, for instance, of sensor technology, which maybe he heard you as saying was too more reactive than you wanted policy to be. But what do you think is the value of deploying that kind of tactical technological response in the field? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the value is 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 obvious, and he described it that the uh, insofar as you can locate the device and uh, and describe its location quickly uh, and in time to those who who are operating in the area you can you can circumvent the problem but uh, you know I think you know the point I was trying to make and if you're talking about an argument I guess the argument is the argument between technological approaches and and human or social approaches you know I, I believe that uh, in this this hierarchy of 
of approaches of, of uh, defeating the device and attacking the network and training the force, that maybe there's another line of operations that we might call understanding the ideology. And there are attempts, uh, very important attempts, and we, we talked about the human terrain system being an attempt to do that. Um, I think they all go, go hand in hand. If you can stop a bomb at the moment before it goes off, that's great. If you can stop it years before, uh, it's a twinkle in the eye of the terrorist who, who thinks about using it. Uh, that's also acceptable. Uh, he and I don't disagree, by the way. I just am too concerned about the recipe for the secret sauce. Yes, understood. Well, so one last question, General Miggs, we'll turn to the audience. Um, I just would be interested in whatever general assessment you can make of the other side, that is the non-state groups themselves. Having studied their presentation in the field, what is the range of their talent and adapti adaptability? Are they getting better? What are their what are their limitations? What are their strengths? You referred to Al Quds and Hezbollah. Do they need state sponsorship to really be disruptive, or can they get to uh, all these technologies on their own as you see them? Well, if if there was no outside supply of IED materials and uh, training from outside of Iraq into Iraq and outside of Afghanistan into Afghanistan, the IED game would be a lot simpler. Um, but there is, and that's just something that uh, we have to deal with. But if you can, as Alec is sort of hinting, if you can get the locals, if you can get a tribe to agree that that IED business is counter to the interests of the tribe, and they're going to stop it, uh, and they are going to use their paramilitaries along those lines, they can shut that down in their area very quickly if the tribe is strong enough and willing to take that risk. And so preferably you don't try to do this on your own. You want to enlist the locals uh, in agreeing that, yep, this is, uh, this is something we've got to work for our own interests. And uh, these allied soldiers here are useful, but they're not the sufficient aspect of the solution. Understood. We've got about 10 minutes to take some questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, Hi. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> My name is Hans Langer. I'm with the, the Cato Institute. Um, you were talking about the path from Cato uh, through Afghanistan. Uh, but has there been any, have either of you come over any evidence to suggest uh, a role with uh, the Soviet, former Soviet republics? You know, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan had you know, cooperation with the Taliban and Al Qaeda before 9 11. Is there any movement between borders up in the north? Alec, you obviously chose the particular venue you did, but you must have looked at other evidence uh, around Afghanistan. What did you see? Right. Um, the, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan um, you know, is, is famously known for this, uh, one of the few suicide attacks that has been um, widely disseminated on the internet. There's a video and propaganda video of, of an IMU attack um, in which a Bavarian-born German citizen of Turkish heritage working for the, this Uzbek terror group uh, perpetrated an attack elsewhere in Afghanistan, certainly out of this, uh, of this area. Um, they are active. Uh, they are a part of this equation. They are working with uh, with other groups in the area. Um, I didn't look at the northern border, and I and I delineated. You know, I I, I, I looked in this this area alone. Uh, we were purposely trying to look along the Duran line. Uh, we divided the Duran line in half logically uh, to focus on what seemed a, a sort of natural division: RC East, a regional command uh, east. Uh, and the Peshawar Shura of the Taliban and, and their portion of the Duran line and then regional command south of ISAF and, uh, and the Quetta Shura of the Taliban. It seemed a logical way to divide it up. Um, very little involvement uh, from, the, from the Central Asian Republics uh, or terrorist groups uh, located in the, in the Central Asian Republics in, in the, the area of this study. Hey, General, can I just ask on the mitigation side, uh, the most stunning statistic you offered was, if I understood it correctly, that your 
unit's work had, along with other factors, reduced the effectiveness of a statistical Iraqi IED by a factor of six between X time and Y time. Right. So if you were to draw a pie chart of the factors in that achievement, what percentage was strategic political change of the ALEC changing the Anbar tribe's attitudes toward war level, and what was tactical mitigation? Boy, that's hard to say. There's no question that the uh, the effort was greatly assisted by the fact that the Anbar Sunni tribes stopped putting out IEDs, obviously. Uh, and it's often forgotten how long it took to get that to happen. Um, but uh, we were we were finding that uh, soldiers were and Marines were getting pretty darn good at finding these things. And in a very large percentage of the ones that were put out were being found and pre-detonated, something like half, I believe. Mm -hmm. You'd have to catch me on that. But that statistics, I think, is in Rick Atkinson's series called Left of Boom. And we were, when I left, we were getting very good about helping the average battalion see the networks in its sector and being able to conduct raid operations to stop them. But again, the the way to really get to the nub of the issue is to get the locals to agree that this is not in their interest and to help shutting it down. Mm -hmm. Good question. Gentleman in the pink shirt there. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. My question is for General Meigs. When Ed Giambastiani was uh, vice chairman, he was particularly impressed about your book on anti-submarine warfare, or so he says and suggested that was one of the reasons why you got the job. I was wondering, to what degree did anything you learned about anti-submarine warfare help you in this particular case? And did you draw on any of the lessons of the Vietnam War when, for example, on the rivers and certain parts of uh, Vietnam, mines and booby traps were really the main casualty makers in that war for a lot of our units? Well, I, uh, interesting question. It's come up before. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing research in my doctorate on an organization called the National Defense Research Council and the Office of Scientific Research and Development and then later, years later, wrote uh, this book about submarine warfare. If you look at the structure of JIDO, there's a lot of 10th Fleet in it. Uh, the emphasis on operations research, uh, the use of the best possible uh, technology focused on intelligence fusion being all the way down to the bottom point of the spear level. Um, so yeah, that was important in my experience in Vietnam. And one of the books, if you read Norman uh, Schwarzkopf's uh, biography, and he talks about taking over the battalion that fought in, uh, that made the huge errors in judgment and moral vigor that it did at My Lai, that battalion had been traumatized by booby traps, the Vietnam version of IEDs. Now, it was very poorly led, but still, one of the problems they had is they kept losing people. You know, every time you got on patrol, it's another day in the box, another day rolling dice, and over time, if they can't find a solution to it, people get really frustrated. So yeah, all of that went into the mix, and uh, along with some really great people and some cooperation by folks in OSD and uh, in the services who generally don't like an outsider coming back and suggesting how they could do things better. <laughs> Where they, they at least uh, asserted themselves on the title of your command. Yes. Uh, William Seymour, George Washington University. Um, I was just curious, to what extent is there um, a channel for feedback to come from innovations made in the field by, um, I suppose, lower-ranked soldiers, or is there innovation and feedback coming from those individuals? There in is, in, in each theater, there is a thing called the SEXI, and I've forgotten what, it's C-E-X-C. -E Combined Explosive. Combined Explosive Exploitation Cell. Exploitation cell. Right, thank you. Those work for the Joint ID Defeat Organization and are a set of uh, organizational sensors to find anything that's out there, both on the enemy side and the friendly side that's working, and get it back to... Uh, Jido, because the director of Jido has a very powerful lever in this battle. He gets multi-year money that is not colored. Now, for those of you that don't understand the lexicon of the defense budget, Congress gives money in 
penny packet compartments so that they can track how that money is spent in each in each of the areas that they mandated in which it be spent and you can't move money from compartment to compartment without going back to, to the appropriations committees in Congress and asking their permission. Vanilla money is a check that allows you to invest that money in anything you think is important. And the director of JIDO has the authority to sign checks up to $25 million on his own proviso. That doesn't exist anywhere else unless you're a very senior program executive officer and the fact that it's multi-year money, two-year money as opposed to one-year money, allows him a lot of flexibility in how he spends it. So there's a very, very powerful tool there that is allowed to leverage the kind of feedback that comes back because you can immediately go to a service and say, look, I see you've got this thing testing and it seems to be working. How about I buy you 25 of them or 50 or 100? And the when I was leaving JIDO, the time between uh, finding a piece of technology on the shelf and getting it in the hands of the troops with a test, which takes time, was 61 days. It's hmm. remarkable. Okay, one more question in the back, and we'll let everybody get back to their offices. Sorry, just going to push the button there. <laughs> Hello? There you go. Uh, the paper mentions that in the 1970s, uh, the use of IEDs began to have a strategic effect, and then later in the paper um, that the TTP evolution tended to be organic and uh, through trial and, er and error. Uh, what degree do you think um, the use of IEDs was sort of originated in Afghanistan uh, during the Soviet occupation as opposed to uh, from external help? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, and I think that one's for me. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, uh, we, we see some clear evidence of that. Um, Lester Grau, the, the really accomplished uh, foreign military historian at uh, Fort Leavenworth, um, recovered and translated, or I don't know if he translated them, but he edited uh, the observations of the Soviet general staff uh, upon the the conclusion, the wind down of their war in Afghanistan, and you know they commented uh, how impressed they were with the the level of innovation and the the threat uh, posed by homemade bombs uh, manufactured then um, in, in the 1980s. Um, I, I don't believe that uh, those that that version of or the mujahideen, as they were known, that they were. The inventors of the IED in any way, uh, it has a long history going back, uh, you know, more than a century and a half. Um, it, was a, it was a Russian czar uh, who was killed, and I, th it was a, I think it was one of the Alexanders who was assassinated by what essentially was a homemade grenade, or there was an assassination attempt. So, so these devices have, have a long life, and uh, as, I, as I try to study them, I think I've realized that we really uh, do not realize the full extent of they're spread around the globe. There are many conflicts where we just aren't uh, we just aren't learning too much about their proliferation. I was reading the other day about devices in Algeria, um, which which uh, you know there are quite a few recent bombings in Algeria that you don't hear about unless you're looking for them. So uh, there's a great deal of evidence that uh, the organic development and, and evolution of these devices um, uh, it can originate anywhere. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both very, very much. Alec, I uh, really admire your uh, self-motivation in this research project. It was something you obviously wanted to see through, and we're just delighted to have played a small role in supporting it and proud that you've been able to bring it forward today in this way. And General Meggs, thank you so much for being here today and for your leadership. That factor of six is something you must be very proud of justifiably. Thank you all for coming. Good job. Thank you, sir. Thank you.